Mr. Surinder Kulkarni, members and supporters of the Observer Research Foundation, my friends, distinguished guests, and of course the members of my extended family, which not only consists of my brother-in-law, my sister, my sister and my nieces, but also my extended family, Mahesh Bhatt and Pooja Bhatt, who have been part of my family for many years, are here. And there are a few other close friends, some going back to my student days. Uh, I haven't met Harbir Singh Sidhu for the last 45 years. And my godson's marriage in Bombay, which suspiciously sounds like the initiation and movement onwards of Sudhinder's scheme of bringing Karachi and Mumbai closer together. Uh, he's marrying a Parsi girl, and he's a Parsi himself. And they both live in London. Uh, but the occasion is a joyous one for me. And of course, it's my second visit to Mumbai this year. And since 1981, when I first came to Mumbai and fell in love with it, I must be honest and say I have never received anything other than generosity, than affection, and love. And of course, it pains me to see any city in the stranglehold of suffocation. This is part of the transition of modern life. Karachi has been in suffocation for so many years. It seems that the large commercial metropolises on the Indian subcontinent's western flank, which were the flag bearers of change, trade, development at a time when monarchies were centered in the heart of the Gangetic Plain and the heart of the Indus Plain. These metropolises today need to struggle for their freedom of expression, but so be it. To struggle, to suffer, to triumph, and to move forward is a South Asian quality. Nowhere is this resilience more obvious than in the cases of Karachi and Bombay. And Karachi and Mumbai have a special relationship. This special relationship is Clearly, the development of Karachi in the most important period of its spread is under the tutelage of the Bombay presidency. And so much cross-fertilization has taken place, so many shared ideas, so many thoughts, so many sentiments. That sentiment, which I most remember, is being told when the call for the night steamer to Goa from Bombay to Karachi would be announced at the West Wharf in Karachi. And that cry fell silent so many years ago. It seems that Sudhinder's dream to restart that boat journey of peace is something which should strike all of us as a decisive move for us to reassert ourselves as civic societies, as metropolitan denizens, sometimes Yes, Sudhinder uses flags to typify this relationship. I've always been very, very nervous about flags. It's not that I don't accept them. It's that the loudest proponents of flags are often governments, and governance has failed us. When Mahesh Bhatt made it by just a whisker to Karachi to bury my mother, who was like his second mother, we prayed that somehow there should be no obstacle to his travel to Pakistan. I think families should not be made to suffer in this way. It's been 60 plus years, many long years. I think we need to be able to reach out to each other. We need, need to be able to put behind these obstacles that separate us. The Berlin walls are sometimes more formidable than they used to be before. And sometimes they show a kind of quality which allows infiltration. But then those who infiltrate are either called infiltrators on one side or the other, or collaboration, collaborationists on the other. With those labels and those words, we wreck the fabric of South Asian heritage and history of so many thousand years, which have kept us together. These bonds will not be able to loosen those ties, but we must allow every generation to be able to I think participate 
in the heritage of their forefathers and their grandfathers and be able to unite people who speak the same tongue, who have the same sentiments, who consider themselves as part of the same family. We South Asians now have families which are based not only on blood ties, but are based on cross-border phenomena where it is not blood, but sentiment, feeling, intellect, and feelings of heart which unite us. I think we need to cast those aside. We need to move forward. I think we need to move into an enlightenment, a light which follows from enlightenment. I don't say governments are the blackest people and they prevent this, but somehow South Asian governments have deserved a legacy of mistrust from their citizens because every year we wait for change and sometimes we are cut off from our families for two years, for three years, for five years. For the most privileged of us to make the access is relatively easy. Governments tend to recognize privileged persons. But I want to know how will Hamid Ansari's or Hamid Ansari's family Hamid Ansari was a boy from Bombay who went to Kohat or went towards Kohat via Kabul and Jalalabad, a torturous route, because he fell in love with a girl in Kohat. That girl seems to be not so traceable. The girl in Lahore who fought for her, for her to meet Hamid Ansari is also not traceable. She's been kidnapped from the courts, outside the courts in Lahore. These stories, which I, one of which I heard today, are stories of our everyday life. Why must South Asian relationship consist of so much pain, so much suffering, so much infliction, and such a lack of competence from governments? I think we need to have a situation where these obstacles are removed. By all, all means, let states work out how to solve plans, how to create solutions, how to structure relationships in a humanistic way. There are too many stories of families that met for the first time after partition, Let's be very honest, these governments are not the inheritors of the decision makers who made partition, but they are inheritors of a legacy, a Berlin Wall legacy, which so many continents have abandoned. Sometimes in the field of human relationships, even Africa seems to be moving forward, and we seem to be moving backwards. I think the cyclical nature of separation in South Asia is something that cannot disunite us, it makes us feel sad that our governments are not able to understand our pain, our sentiment, our feeling, and our right to a relationship across the borders. So I think that when we seek to address a topic which is a reconciliation through rediscovery of a shared past, like also the Hinder Kulkarni uh, formulations, there's always a deeper message run running underneath it. Although it seems self-evident, the reconciliation through rediscovery of a shared past, I think it's important to look at what he really means. What is this shared past? Now, the problem is we all think that a shared past is a rhetorical legacy, that it's something that we have been born with and we have a right to. But I think the time has come when mere rhetoric does not, is not deemed sufficient to be able to establish the shared past that we have. I think we need to work upon this legacy, to research it, to cement it, to bring it to the forefront of the minds of the young demographic upsurge, which constitutes the majority populations in both India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. I think we need to understand that our ties go back not to 50 years ago, not to 100 years ago, but to nine and a half thousand years ago. Why do I say nine and a half thousand years? Because you and I, all of us in this room, the people outside here in the metropolis of Mumbai, the people stretching out across Western India and Pakistan, the people in all parts of India and Bangladesh, owe something to that light of civilization. I know that Sudhinder referred to the light of civilization as the dancing girl at Mohenjo-daro, but Sudhinder is also a little incapacitated like many of us. When he thinks of the shared past, he goes back from 2500 BC to 1700 BC. I go back to 7500 BC. And also important discoveries which are archaeologically coming to sight, which show the whole dynamic of interaction, the whole matrix of interaction 
in South Asia, in Western South Asia, particularly where you and I reside and belong. I refer to Mehergarh. Mehergarh is the most important site, uh, which has been researched heavily by the French archaeological school. The French and archaeological schools now are digging uh, in the, the region of the Indus Piedmont, the area west of the Indus. You see, notions of India are never accurate in our minds of the Indian subcontinent. Basically, the India you would think across in most of Indian history ends at the Indus. It was in the British period and subsequent in the Mughal period when a new interaction began with areas in the northwest like Afghanistan. Traditionally, of course, it was assumed that this Afghanistan uh, interaction stretches only to the northwestern uh, uh, frontier provinces, Fata or tribal areas, which were there since British times. This is, in fact, false. I think the discovery of additional documents relating to Mughal India seem to establish that Mughal uh, interaction uh, with Afghanistan was well to the north of Kabul and Kandahar and well into the region which we traditionally associate with Kunduz and the northern Afghanistan region. In fact, similarly in the west, when we deal with the Mongols, we know about their invasions in Lahore, the destruction of Lahore, the invasions at Delhi. Uh, we know about Nadir Shah's invasion through that western frontier at so many times. But do we really understand how deep this notion of Mughal, uh, of Mongol structure goes in medieval, uh, in the Sultanate and Mughal periods in India? I think that you all know there's a province, a part of a province of the NWFB in Pakistan, which is called Hazara. We all know of the Savlak region in, um, in, in, in UP and Punjab and uh, Haryana and uh, Himachal Pradesh. And I think the Savlak and the Hazara are names that came from that Mughal, those Mongol regiments that used to sit on the Indus. They were not uh, simple Mongol regiments. They were parts of the different clans of the four sons of, or the three sons and the one natural son of Genghis Khan's wife, uh, born as a result of a rape. Uh, he adopted her son uh, upon marrying her. And the four banners were all represented, whether they were Chakhatai, whether they were uh, of any other kind of banner, whether there was a banner of Kublai, which later took over China. All these banners, including the banner of Batu, who was the son of his wife, uh, as a result of conceived from a rape, who he adopted. Batu was the most powerful of the Khans of the Golden Horde, and his empire extended to Europe. So when we see these regiments all sitting, uh, looking down upon Lahore, Ghaznavid Lahore, looking down upon Multan, looking at Delhi, looking at Eastern Punjab, we see a matrix of interaction, a shared legacy of, 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 uh, of, of being the victim of a protrusion or invasion. When we sit and complain today about what the Taliban are doing or what anybody else is doing, we have seen these kind of invasions in South Asia before. The reason we are not able to deal with it, like even medieval governments were able to deal with at some level or the other, is because we stand disunited. United, being united doesn't mean that we become militant blocs and fight against what happens, but it certainly means that we understand each other, we live with each other, we share each other's strengths and weaknesses, we move forward to look at forces that are accumulating on our frontiers. But certainly when I say Mehergar, and I say 7,500 BC, I speak of the rising sun of Mehergar, which to me is a more potent force. It has Zoroastrian influence, it has Central Asian influence. It's not very clear. We like to say the Aryans came from Central Asia. It's not very clear that this phenomenon existed in the way we thought it does. We should know that the indigenous people of the Indus civilization, when I say Indus civilization, what do I mean? I mean that part of your civilization, which was predominant before the Gangetic Plain became the successor. The earlier Vedas belong in the territory I live in. The first, the, the notion of Kalat, which covered Balochistan, Turkmenistan, parts of Iran and Afghanistan, these were territories where Kali was an important entity and a sister hang large, the seven sisters that constitute the essence of Western Indus Vedic religion, which you have forgotten and I have forgotten 
I learned to rediscover under mullahs over my, uh, over my shoulder, and you learn to rediscover with moral monitors and archaeologists and historians talking to you. Your past is cut away from you. You cannot be wholly Indian without us. We cannot be wholly Pakistani without you. The reason is we are part of one psychological dependency. We are part of one psychological dependency. We lost a part of our mind when Pakistan was formed. We lost a further part of our mind when Bangladesh was formed. You lost part of your mind when Pakistan was formed. Because those Western influences, being Indian is not being Hindu, is not being Muslim, it's being Indian. And being Indian means that you are able to receive, as you have for so many years, and overcome thousands of years of civilizing forces and non-civilizing forces. When you look at the population movement in our western flank, we all know where the Rajputs came from or where their forebearers came from. We know how from the well after the, in, the Indus region, we know how the tribes moved down into the frontier region of Pakistan, all the way from northeast China, and how those blocks moved. Eventually, the culture known as Pakhtun culture developed. But in Achaemenian times, in, 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 in 500 BC, it was not that culture. It was a culture where the three major provinces of the interaction of the Iranian Empire and India were the provinces of Gandhara, Arachosia, and Gedrosia. And this doesn't include the influences that were being felt in the Indus Valley or, west of the, or east of the Indus Valley in the Gangetic Plain. So how can we wipe out our connections, our history, our strands of interaction, and pretend that we were born 60 years ago? If you think you were born 60 years ago, then the only person I think you are thinking like is President Ziaul Haq, who banned every kind of historical research in Pakistan prior to 712 BC and said Pakistan was born when Muhammad bin Qasim invaded Sin absolute hogwash. I think we need to understand that the textbooks of the Punjab History Board in Pakistan still tell students that Pakistan was created in 712 AD when the Arabs invaded and then they pretend, they actually go forward and pretend that the Mughals represented Pakistan and Mughal territory was Pakistan. When you try and teach your generations this kind of rubbish what kind of citizens in South Asia are we expecting for tomorrow? I think we need to understand that in Ziaul Haq's time and subsequently in Pakistan, weak democracies where theologians have saddled themselves in textbook boards and strangulated universities, you need to understand that what is happening in your country is not terribly different. It's more intelligent, but communalist history is not part of where we came from. We did not grow up as religions. We grew up as people in interaction with each other. And the survival of India and the might and greatness of the Indian Empire was its ability to assimilate different kinds of thinking. And every great empire, whether Roman or Ottoman, or any empire you can think of in history, has been able to assimilate in the same way. So why should we today, as South Asian citizens, whether of India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, or Afghanistan, or any part of Sri Lanka, or any other part of, of South Asia, why should we accept this inferior status? Why should we lose our interaction matrices? We speak of the development of these countries. What development? The very marketing, natural marketing matrices that were destroyed by partition, roads that were closed down, communities that were created or destroyed through conflict. I was giving Sudhanda the example of the Paramar Sodhas of Tharpakar, who originally hailed from Ujjain. Their local battles in internecine strife with the Rathors pushed the Rathors back towards the Jodhpur side. Now the Paramar Sodhas cannot have their daughters and their sons married unless they go to that very Rathor belt and get husbands and wives from India. And so half of them settle in India and half of them settle in Pakistan. This conflict is not about solutions. This conflict is not about recreating matrices, about reinforcing our natural rights, about reinforcing our market areas. These matrices are about creating Berlin walls. And Berlin walls, they discovered very late in Europe, as late as the late 1980s, must need to come down because there are no limits to the human spirit. If you don't believe me, go to the Vedic poems, go to the Upanishads, go to every holy Hindu scripture or go to any Islamic scripture and mental liberation or the ability to achieve a form of expression, of interaction, of brotherhood, 
with your neighbor, irrespective of his religion. If in the seventh century, Islam could accommodate itself to other religions by speaking of minorities and not speak of exterminating them, then we, as Islam, if you want to give that label in the 21st century, had better learn to do so quite as well. And you as Hindus had better learn to do so, or Muslims, or any other kind of uh, religion, because your, your society is an assimilative society. You didn't believe in the two-nation theory. Why are you now throwing the two-nation theory at us? I ask you that we abandon this politics of the two-nation theory, and we look at each other as South Asian citizens. My friend Rajiv Sethi was coming from Delhi he was supposed to be here today. I worked with him this year on the South. There's Rajiv. Rajiv, please come forward. Please come forward because you represent, you're my guru of South Asian uh, journeys and of being part, uh, having a South Asian nationality. I think Rajiv is putting together a massive show uh, with the help of the Smithsonian in Washington for South Asian heritage in all countries like Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, all of us will be represented, uh, uh, Ladakh, uh, sorry, not Ladakh, um, Bhutan, uh, will all be part of this, uh, and Myanmar, and Myanmar. Uh, Rajiv Sethi at heart, like all, like all Delhi intellectuals, is also an annexationist. He learned it from Pupil Jekar. In fact, part of the annexationism was when I went to the textile museum in Ahmedabad, I looked in one of their rooms and I saw Sindhi handicrafts from the Kutch Gujarat region, and they were described as Gujarati handicrafts. Now, I don't mind, it's not a battle for winning and losing, but the first thing about South Asian identity is due recognition. We need to understand each other. We need to know each other's legacies. And once we know it, we can, ad we can adapt it. It doesn't matter to me if textile, which has 1,500 years of history, comes from Sindh or from Multan or from Gujarat, that Ajrak is part of our South Asian tradition. And we know how to deal with it. So I look back and I see that Mehergar, which came 5,000 years before the big citadels of the Indus Valley civilization are talked about. There were intervening cultures, uh, which have different archaeological names, Fares Muhammad Grey uh, there, there is the Amri culture. There are so many distinct periods in layering. Today, we are on the verge of the Italian and French schools re-examining the whole nature of Bhambor, which is north of Karachi in the Thatta area, northwest of Karachi, northeast of Karachi, and the Sasanian remains, the Achaemenian remains, the Parthian remains, shows that Bhambor, or Debal as it should be called, not Lothal, was the main interactive port and continued well after the collapse of the Sasanians. An, a, a, an archaeologist called Valeria Piacentini started working in Africa and Somalia and East Africa and moved along the entire rim of the Indian Ocean, she noticed the direction of the great force of trade and civilian interface was from a region to the east. She moved over the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, continued her digs, found it further eastward, went into Iran, went further eastward into Makran or Gedrosia, as it was known in the Greek period, moved further eastward, and now that dig is at Karachi. These are the digs. They not only tell us about the Indus Valley, they not only tell us about Achaemenian and Sasanian times, these digs tell us how we reached across in the Indus Valley. Forget these mythical boats, they were part of the system. But the boat from Lothal to, uh, uh, to Babylon was not like the boat from Karachi to uh, Goa via Bombay. These were part of the transmission process. The uncovering of those land routes means that you will change your whole history. We are part of your history. How can you exclude us from your state of mental thinking? You will see that Nefsari was not a single incident where Parsis came across to Gujarat and some kind of minor contact began. There's a whole eastward migration that continues from Achaemenian and Sasanian times, which comes into India. That fertilization is natural because the western seaboard the, uh, the western seaboard of India on the Indian Ocean is part of the Indian Ocean Rim. We have let western archaeologists, western historians, write the history of our own region, so we wonder why we come across as so unimportant. Let me tell you, if you want to fight that phenomenon, you are first going to have to accept that you're South Asian, and then you're going to move forward. And to accept your South Asian identity is for the moment, and I say, uh, I think to uh, perhaps to Sudhinder's 
a chagrin, is to establish a relationship with government where we know better, but we'll go along with you because we need to be united in terms of being people once again. Borders don't matter. We have our own countries, and we should respect. There's one sacred law which was taught as early as the Vedas. That was that you need to respect human life. That means there is no scope for incidents such as what happened in Mumbai these many years ago or what happens in Pakistan today. You should be equally pained because I have been telling my journalist friends in India for the last 25 years, you people are making a mistake of downplaying this Taliban threat. Today that Taliban threat, whether IS or whether in some other form, has come to sit on the most porous border. Governments can put Berlin walls across it, but that border, as Rajiv Sethi will tell you, is that of a natural marketing matrix. My friend Harbir Singh from Cambridge says he would like to work in his later years to restore the natural flow of trade between different parts of the Punjab. I say, why only the Punjab? What about Gujarat and Sindh? What about, uh, 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 what about Bombay and Sindh, Mumbai and Sindh? What about Kutch and Sindh? What about Rajputana and Sindh or Rajasthan? Where are all those regions which are part of our system, of our trade, of our livelihood, of our tastes, of our senses, of our aesthetics. Not so long ago have we become so bereft of our senses that we are going to give up this entire legacy just because two governments can't get their act together. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that Modi, Mr. Modi and Nawaz Sharif are talking to each other. It's an encouraging sign and we should encourage them further because this is not unimportant. It's terribly important for governments to structure the nature of our relationships. But whether we have any right to these relationships, I'm not prepared to let any government decide that, whether Indian or Pakistani, because they have shown not enough responsibility in the last 65 years. We, as a people, have to take matters in our own hands, because it is a shared legacy. I will come to its notion of discovery and non-discovery, but I think that you people, like we, have well to do to remember that partition broke off our connection to the eastern flank. To us, Southeast Asia and Myanmar, once even, Bangla, once even East Pakistan had gone and Bangladesh was formed, these are peripheral con concepts, but they never were for South Asians. Because South Asia's peculiarity as a society or as a series of societies that coexisted together was to interact with all these areas. Your western flank has gone, so much of the vigor the, 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 the art, the expression, the literature, the ballads that come into your life, so much of what constitutes Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Rajasthan has its, its interactive origins across a larger space. I was telling Sudhinder that Indian governments think and Pakistani governments think they've done so well by interacting with Iran. I, I said, what a shabby history of 65 years to speak about when Persian was the court language throughout all of India for so many hundred years. Where is our joint heritage? This is not mine as Pakistan's. This is yours and mine. I simply argue for the right to reinstitute the search, the learning. Now, what happens in this system of Berlin walls? Well, the main institutions that transmit such learning are the universities. So when you speak of the partition of 1947, there was a more deadly partition, and that was 1965, the long partition, where the intellect was cut off. Till today, no Pakistani or Indian ruler or government has spoken about a freedom of interaction amongst universities. If our universities, which are our formal institutions for the pursuit of knowledge, for the pursuit of research results, if these are not allowed to interact with each other, then where can we go? We are left leaderless in government and leaderless in academia. So I think we need to understand that a precondition for a more vigorous movement of the people to understand each other and to stop the intolerance which is being bred from our northwestern borders is to allow academia. It's for you to understand when I heard what a poor number of people were studying Pashto and Dari and these languages, I said, how is India going to cope with the militant threat in the future if its academia is not concentrating on learning languages which will enable them to understand what these people are saying? If you fight with a stranger, if you fight with an unidentified series of warriors, you do so at your peril. You imperil us because you don't know what you're dealing with. I would suggest that the universities in India and Pakistan need to change their way of thinking and need to be allowed when a Pakistani student gets admission, a journalist gets admission to Chennai uh, as the peak of his achievement, 
so he can learn to be the best journalist in the world, he has to end up going to Michigan or Boston University or some, some place in Lebanon or somewhere else because it's not that Chennai or the institution closes its doors to him. It is that the Indian government does not give him a visa to come and study. What I'm saying is the Western countries taught us this so long ago. The basis of their continued relationship with China was the ability to provide Chinese students further studies. If we don't allow our intelligentsia to react with yours, if we don't understand each other's languages, yes, the young people in both democratic surges in India and Pakistan are speaking to each other through the net, but too little knowledge from two sides might not make a complete whole. And I think it's not just knowledge, conversation, and familiarity we seek. We seek deep knowledge and understanding of each other. And I think that that is what governments are preventing and have been preventing, not because they're vicious people. They, too, are prisoners of their own legacies of statecraft. And I think we have to understand that this level of statecraft is akin to a, an incompetence in Indo-Pakistan relations. It is a, akin to an emotional carving up of territory, which asks for a unity of interaction. Why have we to wait so many years? I waited 50 years for this to happen. It hasn't happened in my lifetime. I remember when I, when I, when I was going back from Agra after the talks, which I had seen to Karachi, and I thought, how horrible. We all thought things would improve. It's not Advaniji's fault, or it's not Bajpayee's fault, or it's not Musharraf's fault. There are inbuilt resistance to the opening of borders, which have long historical statecraft ex explanations. What I would suggest to you is it is time to convert them into areas of study which are justiciable by citizen action. And citizen knowledge is the key to such type of informed action. I'm not asking you to rise against your governments. I'm not asking Pakistanis to rise against their governments. I am saying that we have the right to stand up and think with our own free minds and ask ourselves why it is so arduous to make a journey from Karachi to Bombay or Mumbai, why it is so arduous to go to Ahmedabad. Why is it that if we are traveling by land and if we do not have re enough resources, we must go all the way to Lahore to cross over to Amritsar and a half an hour journey or a one hour journey by plane, which used to occur before partition, is now a 24 or 48 hour journey. And the answer is we have become victims of inertia, we have become victims of bad governance, we have become victims of our own self-generated obstacles. I think that universities, academic freedom, freedom of expression, there's enough freedom of expression on both sides of the, of the Indo-Pakistan border. Why is it that that creativity dries up when it comes to writing about relations between India and Pakistan? I think the young, if they applied their natural sense of justice to that, could, could create not a bonfire of the vanities, but a fire to purify a as a prism for all our relationships which need to be examined. I'm prepared to leave the verdict to the young, but I'm not prepared to wait for the young to educate themselves. I want them to grab their rights with their own hands and think very deeply about what I've said. I think that there, there is something which we have to look about, we have to think about, is that when you and I stand in this room, as people who lived, live in Maharashtra or Gujarat, or uh, people who live in Sindh, we even have a deeper tie. From 1843, when the Battle of Miami was fought, and till if maybe a decade afterwards, Sir Charles Napier was the governor of Sindh. From that point on, until 1935, Sindh became part of the Bombay presidency. The separation of Sindh from Bombay was not an Islamic reaction. It was engineered by the, some of the most eminent and enlightened people in Sindh who were Amil Hindus. And it's all down on record. When I say that they fought for autonomy of self-expression, they didn't fight for religions. They didn't fight for the right to be thrown outside their own homes and leave their homes permanently. They fought for freedom. So, we have to understand that if we don't even have this history of the last hundred years together and our togetherness of the roads, of the craft, intellectual ideas, as far as I'm concerned, knowledge means I go and even read those RSS tracts which came out in Sindh in 1910 and 1920. Because if I'm not reading them and I'm condemning communalism out of hand, 
I am committing an academic and perhaps even a humanitarian error. I think we need to understand the entireties of the societies. As I told Rajiv once in Delhi earlier this year, all of us South Asians, we live in ghost cities. Where are ghost cities? You go around the city and you say, Yaha Muslims, Yaha Hindu, Yaha Christians, Yaha Sikh, Yaha Buddhists. What are we doing to each other? We are wiping out those memories when I was doing the Karachi under the Raj exhibition where Advani ji came and Sudhinder is referring to it. We had 5,000 objects from that period of history. But I went crazy just trying to find the picture of two of the ten Hindu mayors of Karachi which had vanished. Whatever I could find, finally I completed the list, I got the pictures, but coming to Bombay sometimes was the only way it was Bombay at that time. And forgive me for saying Bombay too often, because in the period that we have been cut off from you, we haven't even grown used to using the word Mumbai, which came as part of your legislation, because the Berlin Wall has been existing between us. So I think you must forgive me, I'm make, not making a political statement when I say Bombay. I mean to say Mumbai because I mean to respect you. It's simply that you cut me away for so long, I find it difficult to name you by your correct name. So I think that it's, it's, it's important. We also, have, we also have other, you know, really humanitarian issues. There are Sindhis living in Bombay, Lucknow, etc. But let's go to Mumbai first of all. There are thousands of them. Do you have the right to take away from them their right to understand what is happening in Sindh. As Pakistanis, if we do it, we are to be condemned. As Indians, if you do it, having had the freedom of expression, having had education, having had all these things, it's unforgivable. Because committees that, uh, the uh, communities that were formed as a result of exodus deserve our special attention. We need to be able to give them a sense of belonging in South Asia. Whether they live in Mumbai or they live in Sindh is not the primary thing. Whether they are contented in that the, the spirits of their ancestors are at peace. It does mean something. That Chinese adage of being able to look at the spirits of your ancestors, to be able to go back to graveyards, to places where ashes are strewn, to be able to go to Udero Lal, to be able to go to those shrines, to look at the vibrant plant of Sindhi Sufism, its ability to get adherence from Muslims, from Hindus, from all parts. I think sometimes the pleasure of religion is being able to speak to your neighbor who doesn't belong to the same religion, particularly when he's a member of your family. I think the notion of the South Asian family should never be overcome by the notion of separatist religions. Because when we look at our differences, we forget that we have had nine and a half thousand years of shared history. More pernicious than the partition of 1947 was the long partition of 1965. And there the wall was set between the intelligentsia that's when things began to really break down. I don't think we are in that bad position we were in 1965, but we still have a lo long way to go. I think that we need, to disc we need to react, we need to deal with new things, we need to deal with militarism from the northwest of Pakistan, which is moving across, which is taking lives in urban areas in Pakistan, and has taken lives in places like Mumbai. And I think we need to be able to understand this phenomenon and fight back together. How are we going to be able to fight back together when we can't even talk to each other? But we, we spend months as governments simply deciding what we can say and what we cannot say to each other. I've never heard of this absurdity before where you're not prepared to talk about peace by talking about all issues. I don't believe Pakistan has a right to say we won't talk about terrorism, and I don't believe that India has a right to say we don't talk about Kashmir. How does the talking about Kashmir and bringing peace to Kashmir compromise the retention of rights? Although, let me tell you very clearly, that neither Pakistan nor India have a very good case in Kashmir because we have been both taking advantage and exploiting the Kashmiris in sometimes in violation of our own constitutions. If we are violating 20 years or 15 years of Pakistani democratic constitutions of, of late, you are, you are violating 65 years of Indian democratic constitutions. Look at what these people don't even have water user rights which are specific to their areas. They belong downstream to India and Pakistan. So I think we also need to be a little careful. We need to understand, let us be part of the same family, let's work it out, let's not repeat the kind of mistake that was made in 47, which Sudhinder refers to in his books, which is, what is a mistake? This all or nothing is not the way that families live. There's give and there's take, there's persuasion, there's adjustment, there's dialogue, 
There's learning to live together because there is a least reason to live together. That living together is so many thousand years of our shared past. So I think that what we need in South Asia, when we speak of discovery or rediscovery of that shared past, what we need is a new model, a new model to understand what are the duties, not just rights, the governments know their rights very well, what are the duties of government? And I tell you, this model can be drastically altered if the Pakistan government realizes part of its duty is to speak to citizens of India across the border and to bring them into confidence. The Indian government has to speak to Pakistani citizens in the same way and take us into confidence because you are talking about us and our destinies and you are making policies and creating of obstacles to that road to peace without any input from us, without any talking to us, without our democratic right to dissent. So rather than making or creating a situation where you have a hysteria every time somebody stands up for their democratic rights, I say the Indian government needs to talk to me and the Pakistan government needs to talk to you and the Bangladeshi government needs to speak to citizens of both Pakistan and India. We need to explain our governments to each other and to the people because without the metropolitan areas particularly, if you don't take metropolitan public opinion into count, you are not speaking for Pakistan, India or Bangladesh. You're only speaking for your own political survival or your own political machinations. So I think that we need to have a responsible method of governance in all South Asian countries. I think that we need to look at what earlier, uh, I think, uh, Sudhinder announced as a Sindh Research Project. The Sindh Research Project is part of the problem of rediscovery and discovery. It's both, because there are areas of Sindh and the joint history of Sindh and the Bombay presidency, and prior and post that, which have not been adequately addressed. What we propose to do is first of all, isolate and bring out all the documents in the Maharashtra archives because the Bombay presidency was the capital. And we hope that Sudhinder's organization, the Observer Research Foundation, will help us find research fellows who will be able to pick out these documents once those documents from the 17th century up to the 20th century are made available, not a selection of. I'm speaking of 10, 15, 20 volumes, as many as are necessary, because I don't think we can take shortcuts with each other's identities. We need to understand all the detail. Once these are all made available, then the idea is to ask historians in both Karachi, Mumbai, in Hyderabad, in Ahmedabad, in, uh, in Kutch, to write about these phenomena and comment on them, because the local variation sometimes may be the exception, but it helps you understand the rule. So I think that the three periods that we are referring to, the first is the period from the 17th century when the explorations of the Indus, Delta of the Indus, and the strategic implications of it for the British seem to be the most important factor as seen from, uh, as seen from the Bombay presidency. And that period continues uh, in, from, the, from the 17th, 18th centuries by about in, up to the expeditions into Sindh which led to the annexation of Sindh. From that point on, after Napier, decisions with respect to Sindh are made in Mumbai. And therefore, the rich materials concerning the security implications, the Afghan wars, the local treaties, the local economic circumstances. Mumbai was not a non-benevolent ruler for Sindh. It simply was that the Sindhis, both Hindu and Muslim, wanted their own identity. Hindu, Muslims less because the uh, Intellectual light of that period was the Hindus of Sindh. So the idea is that many projects were undertaken. One of them in which Pakistan survives today is the Sakhar Barrage. If you look at the exploration of municipal uh, finances in various towns of Sindh, in the records, in the Maharashtra archives, it will tell you more of the problems of governance which Sindh is facing today and perhaps be able to alert you to some of those things which need to be taken into account. This is not a political propaganda project. This is a research project which, will, which is commissioned by the Sindh Endowment Fund, of which I'm managing trustee. And we will have an agreement with the Observer Research Foundation for the conduct of this project. This is not to blacklist or denigrate the Maharashtra archives. This is to show that they are the safe place 
of a long history and legacy of our shared relations. So when we say discovery, that seems to be clear. Rediscovery, I think we need to rediscover ourselves to that extent so then that is clear. But we need to launch new methods to uncover and rediscover what was it that made us stick in the past. Because simply saying, we discover it was religious ties, we discover it was trade ties, these are only simple uh, propositions. We need to look at the very complex nature of our interaction. For that, we need to go to our education systems, to our art, to our history, to our operation of elites, to our operation of governance. And I promise you that, as I was telling Sudhinder the other day, I was at M.G. Akbar's daughter Dia's wedding in Goa about 10 years ago. And there was a group of people from Bombay and Delhi, and we were all sitting on the beach. And Dia wanted me to be able to speak for the five, seven minutes before sunset. So at the time, her wedding was being sealed. And I did my little bit, and then the sun wouldn't go down. So Dia sent me a message that wait till the Goa sun goes down because the Ave Maria will be sung as the darkness is coming by a Portuguese, uh, by a Portuguese trained singer from the university in Goa. So all I could speak about was Shah Abdul Latif, the great mystic poet of Sindh. I spoke of his Sur Samundi or the Sur of the Mariners. I spoke of the fisherwomen in the Tata flatlands waiting for the return of boats to the fishing village which had gone on a, co on a cruise down Maharashtra, the Coromandel Coast, and Sri Lanka. And the voice from the heavens of the beloved comes back to these women, that your husbands have drowned in these boats. They've encountered the face of the beloved under the ocean. And you need not to grieve, but to celebrate that they have seen reality, that mutual shared experience of the course of Sin, Gujarat, Bombay, or Maharashtra, Kerala, and Sri Lanka will always remain with me as my guide through this dark hour. Thank you.